from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode number 192, recorded on February 11, 2021. And joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And hello, Daniel, when you say hello. <laughs> and from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. You know, now with the Zoom, with the visual, I guess I'm always here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're never going to go back to uh, the way we used to be with just audio. Now that we are used to Zoom, we can see each other and... Well, this has been us. a remarkable transition, I think. I, I, I'm very impressed. I began my course uh, last Friday. I have another one tomorrow. And, um, you know, you see all the students. You get to know whether they're awake or asleep. <laughs> you can tell when they go out for a, a pee or something because the screen goes blank and then they come back on again. <laughs> but it's it's a different world because you can you can really uh, – I think you can learn this way. I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that it's a good a good technology for uh, not just remote learning, but just learning. Well, not everybody can learn, unfortunately. There are some people who can't handle screens, actually, and I have that in my course. And Oh, is that right? Is yeah, that right? I mean, you have something about the, I don't know, really? but you have, to, you know, so it's not for everyone. It's too bad. Yeah, I'm not sure my uh, 15 year old son Barnaby is thriving in this <laughs> virtual learning um, environment. To be honest, yeah, well, very yeah. few teachers are catching COVID 19 that way. That's the reason why this is working out so well. I think. Yeah, I, mean, I think teaching is good in person. Other things are good on Zoom, no, agree, like meetings but, uh, and this sort of thing is fine on Zoom. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Speaking of meetings, let's uh, do TWIP. Daniel, remind us of our case. Uh, yes. yes, for everyone um, tuning in, tuning back in or tuning in for the first time, <laughs> um, we we went to Malawi. Um, I don't know if I gave much of the background, but I was in Malawi um, it was a few years ago. I went there with the family because my wife's sister was living in the long way. Um, you know, so it's uh, took the whole family and we spent a couple of weeks in, in Africa. The kids actually loved it. They didn't really want to come home. So. Um, we thought they would appreciate everything they had here. They, they loved Malawi. Um, but <laughs> this was a case. Um, this is a teenage son um, of a USAID worker, and his urine started to turn red. Um, and th this USAID worker w was somewhat new to Malawi. Um, and I, I use that mainly. He was not sure what was going on. Um, and we got a little bit more of the history and that on uh, weekends, um, the family, the USAID worker, his family would drive about two, two and a half hours east to a lake, Lake Malawi, and they would actually go swimming. Um, so when this happened, um, the USAID worker um, took his son uh, to the clinician there, um, the embassy clinician. Um, the, cl the clinician there was familiar with what this was. Um, and as I mentioned last time, uh, was given pills, take these pills in the morning, take them at night, cleared right up. Um, and um, we were left with what was going on. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. Should I mention that Mal Lake Malawi is famous uh, for many things? One is the uh, it's a living example of uh, radiative evolution for mm -hmm. cichlids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, geographically isolated from all the other lakes, although they're connected by rivers. They're not really connected by wildlife. So you can study the fish life in each of these lakes and make uh, speculations as to how species arise based on their geography. And Lake Malawi has played a huge role in that um, process. It's like almost like Darwin's finches for fish. And it's a very, 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 very old lake. That's the reason. And it's tropical, so it, it's, it remains the same year-round, basically. It's an, an unusual chain of lakes, actually. So... Uh, 
It's worth well, noting that, by the way. Yeah, well, after we after we run through the emails, maybe I'll even share my personal experience when my family and I went to Lake <laughs> Yes, we would love to hear about that. <laughs> I used to uh, raise cichlids in my aquarium years Did ago. Did you now? Yeah, when I was a grad student. I used to have a salty, cool. you know, slightly salty water. And uh, they were beautiful. Right? Beautiful. They are. And um, quite fascinating to look at, I think. Dixon, can you take the first one, please? I would be happy to. Eric writes, greetings. And thank you for your fantastic uh, flora of podcasts and online lectures. There is so much to learn, and you are such pleasant educators. Since Daniel said this was an easy case, I thought I'd give it a go. My guess is that the poor teenager had been swimming among parasitic flatworms, schistosoma hematobium, and contracted urogenital schistosomiasis, also known as snail fever or bilharzia. Treatment is a short course of praziquanto. Fascinating little worms. Don't go swimming with snails in other people's pee. Hmm. I humbly bow to your knowledge and expertise and your healthy approach to science. Uh, they're from Linköping, Sweden. I've been to Linköping. That's a very interesting little place uh, where it's two degrees C, a light snowfall with a class three warning of severe snowstorms for the night. Eric, just a curious listener. Oh, P.S. I managed to find this rather amusing pearl on the web. and I haven't had a chance to download it, but um, I will. It's a really interesting article about the difference between case fatality, risk, rate, and ratio. <laughs> Ah, right. Oh, right. It's good. And I have also been to Lin Xiaoping in 2019. I, I passed through lovely little town, D Dixon. It, really, it is. It really is. Really nice. <clears throat> Daniel. All right. So I've never been to Sweden, but I do want to go. David writes, hello, Team Twip. Wonderful episode as always. Thanks for continuing to provide the listeners with your insights into the world of parasites, parasitic diseases, and scientific research into the same. The show is an intellectual diversion from the realities of the pandemic and political divisions, at least for a few minutes. Given Dr. Griffin's statement that he was throwing us a bone, I'll go for what looks like a good match, schistosoma causing schistosomiasis. The symptoms seem like a very good match and the disease is treatable quickly as in the single day of treatment that Dr. Griffin states for this case with praziquantel. Of course, the seventh edition of Parasitic Diseases has a thorough discussion of various aspects of the schistosome starting on page 379. Highly recommended. Thanks again for the wonderful content. I look forward to every new show. Stay well, David. Tim writes, Daniel Dixon and Vincent, the red urine post-swim in Lake Malawi is certainly schistosomiasis brought on by an infection of schistosoma hematobium. Medication is praziquantel brand name Biltricide. The life cycle diagrams from your book are helpful thinking about each of these worms. I spent a couple of hours reading up on this after a good read through the seventh edition of PD. I'll spare you the very many odd facts I learned, but I am ready for my first post-pandemic cocktail gathering, to say the least. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are no cell assays of S. hematobium to match that of S. mansoni. Uh, from Went, Zhao Collins et al. in the paper discussed today, a single-cell RNA-seq atlas, which we did last time. But certainly, these technologies will yield a different view of these parasites and biology in general in the coming decade. It is a good time to be a parasitologist, as human encroachment is widening niches for these buggers. I had not realized the scope of the problem until this evening. It might have been an easy case. It was a good lesson. And Tim sends a link to an article on, on this in the... Uh, the cartercenter.org. Oh, great. Yes, where you can see uh, interesting photographs, which we'll mention later. <laughs> Carter sends a nice, nice place. Yeah. Good people down there. Dixon, you're next. Samantha, although the, uh, the, the letter is addressed just to Professor Racaniello, I will <laughs> read this anyway. <laughs> I would like to start off by thanking you for such a wonderfully informative and entertaining podcast series. I'm a second-year medical student and a 
2018 Barnard graduate uh, who has been binge watching your videos for the past week since rediscovering your channel. Your podcasts are ten, a thousand times more exciting than my online pre-recorded medical school lectures. <laughs> it's nice to feel like a Columbia student again after three years listening to an expert in his field share his knowledge with enthusiasm and purpose. And I am very thankful for you and your mission to bring such high quality educational content to the public. Regarding Dr. Griffin's challenge, I believe the teenager has schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma hematobium. The main clue that made me think of schistosoma infection is the patient's hematuria. Schistosoma is known to infect the bladder, resulting in such, in such bloody urine. Furthermore, this parasitic fluke, uh, blood fluke is endemic to sub-Saharan Africa, among other regions, which fits the patient's recent geographic location. Schistosoma hematobium's hosts are snails. Sicaria from the snails penetrate the skin, migrate to the liver to mature into adults, and then into the visceral venous plexus, which surrounds the neck of the bladder. The patient's history of freshwater swimming is also pertinent positive, since this indicates a potential source of exposure. We just learned about this parasite in school, so perhaps I have some cognitive bias. <laughs> all the best, Samantha, a very curious medical student with a newfound love for all things viruses and parasites. Lovely. Well, Samantha, you, um, I, I think you're referring to the fact that you go to school at Columbia also. Um, I used to teach there a lot and uh, miss, miss the contact with the students, and I'm glad to hear that the subject is still doing well. Daniel. All right. Rachel writes, good morning, TWIP team. It's overcast and about 25F, negative 4C here in Indianapolis. And I'm just trying to stay warm. I'm a longtime listener, but this is my first time writing in because I'm terrified of getting it wrong. My interest in parasitism is newfound but strong. And I'm so grateful to have a backlog of episodes to go back and make guesses on with instant certification of my answers. Or the young man in Malawi urinating blood. I think it's safe to say he was infected with schistosomiasis, specifically by S. hematobium. The tricky trematode hatches in water and is commonly found in Lake Malawi, especially affecting tourists and expats with less experience with this pathogen. Once infected, the patient will notice blood in the urine as the adult worms infect the bladder. One day of treatment with Praziquanto will effectively clear up this infection, which I suspect to have been the drug prescribed. This isn't a, lo a lot of differential for this particular case, as it is pretty cut and dry and can be clinically diagnosed. Fun fact, this parasite was what initially got me interested in epidemiology and specifically medical anthropology, as it was used as a case study in my introduction to biological anthropology course seven years ago. Of course, now come the trials of grad school and my eventual PhD, so I can get to the point where I just hang out with worms all day. Thank you for everything. Stay safe, Rachel. Hmm. Hang out with worms, Dixon. Is that a good idea? <laughs> um, if you don't by a first name basis, yes. If you don't, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to think about that one. <laughs> AK writes, good evening, esteemed hosts. A welcome reprieve from all things COVID. I find myself looking forward to TWIP more and more. I'd say schistosomiasis hematobium until proven otherwise. Incidentally, one of my absolute favorite parasites, if such can be said about a disease-causing pathogen, it has an absolute fascinating spectrum of symptoms. We actually find quite a few among our immigrants from refugee camps with diagnosed active or latent TB, though we find even more strongyloides. As I recall, we also had a remarkably interesting case a few years back, though quite tragic, a child with neuroschistosomiasis with transverse myelitis, of which the details have slipped my mind. Stay safe. AK is an ID physician. <laughs> Dixon. Byron writes, hello, TWIP hosts. It's 32F here in Naperville, Illinois, and sunny. Here is my guess for TWIP 191. Schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma hematobium. Gotta say, it really helps to have the latest PD on hand. Thank you for all the hard work. It has been a lot of fun listening, Byron. 
Daniel. Michael writes, I'm relatively new to TWIP, but I thought I would give a guess to Dr. Griffin's case study in TWIP 191 about the teenager swimming in Lake Malawi. My guess is at the end of this email. I started listening in May 2020 to TWIV to learn more about the SARS-CoV-2 virus while in lockdown and soon started listening to all other shows on Micro TV as well. I especially want to thank you for the Virology 2020 videos on YouTube, which are both informative and also make me wonder at how inventive viruses are through natural selection to adapt and multiply. They are truly amazing, and I wish there was a greater emphasis on funding basic science. Keep up the good work. Thou, Oakland, California. And then he says, urogenital schistosomiasis by parasitic flatworms schistosomes, also known as bilharzia or snail fever. And I want to keep that in mind. That's, that's an interesting, that is a slightly different guess than we've had so far. Hmm. Caroline writes, bonjour, as a first-time guesser, I hope this try isn't too bad, especially since you implied it may be easy. I'm guessing it's just a semiasis. A bit of research led me to find that this parasite is endemic in Lake Malawi and so causes many infections in tourists. One common symptom is blood in the urine. The typical treatment for schistosomiasis is usually one dose of praziquantel. Sometimes this is split into two doses taken within 12 hours. This treatment matches what was prescribed to the patient in your case. Thank you so much for all these podcasts. I've been listening to you for a long time and the episodes keep getting better and better. Stay safe. Caroline is a water treatment operator. Mm -hmm. Dixon. Ida writes, Dear team at TWIP, Ida here, writing from Barcelona. I listened excitedly to each of your programs, but this is my first time attempting an answer. I'm a PhD student in archaeology at CUNY, conducting an archaeoparasitology research, that is, the study of parasitism in ancient populations. Archaeological parasitology is an interdisciplinary field that combines parasitology and archaeological methods to investigate specific patterns of ancient parasite infections in relation to environment, diets, behavior, and disease. It also has an objective to trace the origin, evolution, and dispersion of different parasites worldwide and and offers epidemiological insights that can help model modern trends. Fascinating field. My answer to your case study for TWIP 191 is Bill Hartzia infection caused by the fluke parasite Schistosoma hematobium. This parasite is widely spread in many countries in Africa, including Malawi, and it is endemic from the shallow waters of Lake Malawi, where there are diverse species of snails that serve as intermediate hosts. After sexual maturation occurs within the snail and the parasite reaches the infective larval stage, Sicariae, these are liberated into the fresh water. Humans, who are the final host, can get infected when their skin gets in contact with the Sicaria in contaminated waters. These will penetrate the skin, finding final home in the urinary bladder. The symptoms range from pain during urination to inflammation of the bladder, including bloody urine, as is the case for this week's patient. The miraculous treatment mentioned in the program is a 40 to 60 milligram dose of praziquantel per kilogram of body weight administered in one or two doses six hours apart. Fun fact, the first ever archaeological archaeoparasitological analysis conducted was undertaken by Rufer in 1910 in a 5,000 year old Egyptian mummy that gave positive that, that was positive for schistosoma hematobium and she lists the reference there as well thank you for your fantastic program I don't know if I win the book or if my answer is right but it was sure fun trying <laughs> best Aida cool Daniel all right. Alexander writes, Dear Twippers, the young man new to Malawi has probably contracted an infection with schistosoma hematobium while swimming in Lake Malawi. The sucariae swimming in the water during the day penetrate the skin and migrate to the bladder, among other places, where only this species critically causes hematuria. Praziquantel is the drug of choice here. 
interesting that characteristically bloody urine was interpreted as a form of male menstruation and a rite of passage for young boys by the ancient Egyptians. Unfortunately, efforts to eradicate this disease in Egypt by mass injection of medications may have led to widespread hep C in the country. All the best to you and all your fellow Twippers. Alexander enjoying gentle snow flow, snowfall at negative 3C, 27F here in Vienna. Yeah, I know that uh, that hep C spread by the schistosome medication is such an unfortunate incident. It's just horrible. They didn't steri- properly sterilize the syringes. Horrible, horrible. Jay writes, I'll start with my guest, schistosomiasis hematobine, reasoning. Rest of the family are well, but visiting son is not. I assume they had repeated exposures, but the son had not. And he showed symptoms. The two and a half hour drive would take you from Lilongwe, where a visiting aid worker is likely to be based, to the south of the lake. The paper below shows S. hematobium to be endemic to that part of the lake. Paper number two points out that S. hematobium targets the urinary tract with hematuria as a common symptom. And the third paper linked to the CDC shows praziquantel twice a day orally as the treatment, which again tracks with given pills taken morning and night clears up. I have another challenge for you. In this case, I am the patient. I was about five years old and traveling by passenger liner from Colombo, Ceylon, as it was then, to Southampton, UK, via the Suez Canal with my parents and younger brother and sister in the early 60s. My mother took me to the ship's doctor with apparent blood in the urine early in the journey. The MD took blood and urine samples but did not have equipment to run tests, but took them ashore in Aden, and we picked up the results in Cairo. After the visit... To the doctor, my parents became much nicer to me and far more forgiving of the problems a very active five-year-old caused them on the ship, including (laughs) diving into the ship's doctor into the pool and knocking him out. (laughs) This lasted until we picked up the results in Cairo. This ship was entirely to blame, although my parents seemed to think it was my fault. In the dining room, there was a big plate on which there was a Jenga tower made of wafer biscuits. I liked the pink ones, and you could help yourself, and the staff rebuilt it, ready for me to return for more. Had the doctor asked me how many pink wafer biscuits I ate a day when my <laughs> why my urine was red probably would have been solved years earlier. Just a long-time TWIV listener dipping into TWIP. Well, that's fascinating. Love it. Uh, I think that's funny. Dixon. Yes, sir. Andrew writes, good evening, TWIP hosts. It is a wonderful 12C and clear in Greenville, North Carolina, which would sound fairly pleasant if my classroom's heater had not broken down here recently, leaving the room temperature to be a brisk 18C. Thankfully, the County Board of Education finally transitioned to 100% virtual this week after several harshly written emails about their mishandling of the pandemic. I have been listening to Microbe TV podcasts for about two to three years now and figured I would give this a shot. Please don't expect anything spectacular from me as I'm a high school science teacher and I work part time at the local hospital running the RT-PCR tests for SARS-CoV-2. Granted, with the volume tests, the volume of tests being run, it certainly does not feel part time. On the guess, I suppose, after consulting Dr. Google, WHO, and NCBI, I am going to postulate that the teenage boy has schistosoma hematobium. I come to this conclusion primarily based on location in the treatment plan. The WHO's website matched location and symptoms to the case study. When looking at treatment, I found praziquantel as the drug of choice meeting that description. For some odd reason, I feel the need to make sure that the weight of the boy matches a typical teen given the treatment. So again, back to Google, a typical pill has 600 milligrams times the four pills given leaves us with 2,400 milligrams, seeming how the dosage is 40 milligrams per kilo divided by two doses in 12 hours. That would make the child in the ballpark of 132 pounds or 60 kilograms. This makes me feel better about my non-medical diagnosis. If it would have been way off, I would have kept looking for another alternative. Just for fuzzies or funsies, I did come across a meta-analysis paper on NCBI suggesting that this treatment may not need to be split into two doses over 12 hours and that having a single dose may lead to less vomiting and dizziness as a side effect from the medication. Thank you for your time. And if I happen to win a book, I would love for it to be given to my high school here. 
It would be a fantastic tool to get students interested in other fields of biology. Many of my students, until we get uh, our disease unit, don't even realize humans can get parasites except for relationships. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> All right. Anthony writes, schistosomiasis is endemic in Lake, in Lake Malawi, perhaps due to overfishing. Evidence of infection has been found in ancient Egyptian mummies. The disease was common in Egypt up into the 20th century. A physician with Napoleon's army described the blood in the urine as male menstruation. Did the 1 slash 9 Parasites Without Borders Facebook post prompt the selection of this case? Thank you. Um, and then Anthony's got a few things in here about Theodore Maximilian Bilharz. Um, being a German physician, an important pioneer in the field of, field of parasitology, um, and then a few other facts um, below. All right. I think Anthony wants to be the new Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Sophia writes, Happy New Year. Thank you, Daniel, for giving us a case that I can actually answer. I had no clue for the cases presented recently, but I was impressed by the number of people who guessed right. They bring the level up. Don't assume that the rest of us are as good. Anyway, my guess is schistosomiasis. I love diagnoses that can be made with no tests and treatment is easy and available. You will get loads of answers for this one, so I'm keeping this short. Stay safe and thank you for all that you do. Dixon. Leo writes, Dear Distinguished Professors, Greetings from the village of Mendocino in the northern California coast. Current temperature is 57 Fahrenheit with fog clearing. Uh, and he lists the weather um, website. I am just a former winery manager with a lifelong interest in science and discovery. I watched my first TWIV last January and have become a fan of all the microbe TV programs. As to Dr. Griffin's case presentation in TWIP 191, I think that this adolescent male contracted urinary schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma hematobium. The blood in the urine is the result of bladder perforations as the parasite releases eggs to be passed through the urine. I have no idea of why the rest of the family did not come down or become infected. Should they be given a dose of prosequantol just because? It would be fun to use as a differential the African version of a case that allegedly happened in the Amazon. A man was urinating into a river when a small carnivorous fish followed the urine stream and became lodged in his urethra. Uh, that's a candura. This reportedly caused pain and a profusion of blood with or without urination. I look forward to the big reveal, wishing everyone happy health, happiness, and long life. Sincerely, Leo. Is that true, Dan Dixon Daniel, that this fish f does swim up the urine stream? Kanduro, it's a, it's a, it's a, a small uh, catfish that actually infects the gills of larger catfish. Mm -hmm. and by rubbing its uh, spikes along the gill rakers, it elicits the blood to come forth and it actually feeds on the blood that comes out of the gills. Yes, this is a very, very tiny organism. Uh, it's a less than an eighth of an inch long. And I think Kevin gives reference to it. As we get to Kevin's uh, letter, you'll see that he's okay. referenced uh, that as uh, one of his <laughs> many, many <laughs> diversions. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, no, unfortunately, Vincent, and maybe we'll get to this, it has a morphology where it goes in, but it can't come back. Yeah, exactly out. right. The, the spines go, they fold back as he goes yeah. in, but then they, they lock. Lovely. Yeah, Lovely. So. Yes. Yes. Love, lovely things in the world. Um, <laughs> Katie Jane <laughs> writes, dear all, I'm writing from Chile, north central Wisconsin, where it is a sunny 6F with a real feel of negative 3F, negative 14C with a real feel of negative 19C. You know, the type of weather where you wonder why you own livestock. My first thought for the case study in episode 191 was schistosomiasis, but I thought that'd be too easy, given that the paper in that episode was also on schistosomes. However, I did not realize that there are many species of schistosome. I love learning from you all. The three most common species are schistosoma mansoni, S. japonicum, and S. hematobium. According to PD7, in the case of S. japonicum and S. mansoni infection, the injury occurs when eggs are deposited in the walls of the intestine and in the liver, whereas infection with S. hematobium affects the bladder. Bladder infection can result in hematuria or blood in the urine, 
which was the main symptom in this patient after spending time swimming in Lake Malawi. According to the CDC website, fresh water becomes contaminated by schistosoma eggs, which infected people urinate or defecate in the water. I know we all know that this happens, but gross, people are gross. The CDC website also states that vigorous towel drying after an accidental very brief water exposure may help to prevent the schistosoma parasite from penetrating the skin. Daniel did not make the comment that perhaps the boy had been swimming and maybe hadn't toweled off quite as vigorously as he should have. Treatment for schistosomiasis is with a one to two day dose of praziquantel. This all seems to fit. So I'm going with schistosomiasis caused by S. hematobium as my guess. Diagnosis could be confirmed by urine sample, although I'm guessing that if the infection is endemic, the medical professionals in the area have probably seen it enough that they don't necessarily need to confirm the symptoms with a diagnostic assay. I have made it one of my New Year's resolutions to write in for every TWIP case study this year. I am also training for a half marathon, and I find your podcasts keep me much better distracted from the pain and misery my legs are suffering than music does. As always, thanks for all you do. Martha writes, dear TWIP people, when listening to this episode's case, I was sure I knew the parasite and the treatment, but as my usual practice, I decided to poke about on the internet a bit. I thought I remembered that the disease had been mentioned in ancient Egyptian papyri and wanted to check it out. For some reason, it had lodged in my brain that the disease was so prevalent in Egypt that there was actually a hieroglyph for it and that the ancients equated hematuria in men to menstruation in women. Well, turns out the ancient Egyptians did have a word for it. That word apparently is ah. <laughs> ancient <laughs> doctors seem to recognize the association with water and advised against standing in polluted water. Not e easy with an agricultural system that depends on yearly flooding of the fields. However, the conflation of hematuria and menstruation was made by the French physicians in the Napoleonic era occupation. And I just learned archaeologists are finding the agent of this affliction in ancient mummies' bladders. So enough digression. You have a lot of mail to read. I think the young man had schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma hematobium and was treated with a one-day course of praziquantel. Thank you for all your work. I thoroughly enjoy your podcast. Dixon. Well, I got lucky. You got, I lucky. got Kevin's email. Yes, I love reading <laughs> Kevin's email anyway, and aloud, it's even better. So let's start. Kevin writes, when you hear hoofbeats, look for rainbows. <laughs> Now, if I were doing this, of course, that would be rainbow trout, but for him, I'm sure that means something else. I do detest a chestnut. Likewise, for easy phrases such as slam dunk or no brainer, call me a sententious pedant. I can take it. It wasn't too long ago that Lake Malawi was considered no risk for schistosomiasis. Just consult the 1992 Lonely Planet Tourist Guide for Africa. Centron's 1996 review, Schistosomiasis in Lake Malawi, also reviews the early 90s consensus opinion that the area was very low risk for transmission. His descriptions of neuroschistosomiasis in two Peace Corps in 1992 quickly changed these perceptions. The immediate reflux or reflex in our current case is to say schistosoma hematobium. By the way, this worm should have an identity crisis, having been known variously as dystomum hematobium, bilharzia hematobium. And let's not ignore this worm's erotic potential. Two suckers, a gynecophoric canal, and a an copula, and an incopula lifestyle, as they say, what could possibly go wrong? What I find most disturbing in this case is the fact that no diagnostics were run on the patient even in the face of the overwhelming likelihood that S. hematobium infection uh, was the answer. The importance of objective and definitive demonstration of the diagnosis is never to be devalued. Simply centrifuging the urine and fighting ova would be sufficient, though this may be low sensitivity in light infections. Serologic testing six to eight weeks post suspected infection should be attempted. Obtaining hard evidence is crucial in the event that rare complications arise in the future, such as neuroschistosomiasis. Occasionally, I'm sorry, additionally, and as we have repeatedly stressed in previous TWIP cases, the construction of a differential diagnosis is important to avoid premature closure and to account for the possibility of simultaneous or co-occurring pathologies. 
Non-infectious causes of hematuria in adolescents are listed in the endnotes. Other unusual and unlikely parasitic causes of hematurias are ascariasis, trichinella, myiasis, uh, renal echinococcus, referenced in endnotes. In our case, the patient was doubtlessly, uh, no, yeah, doubtlessly given praziquantel, though the CDC states that the repeat treatment may be needed two to four weeks after initial treatment in order to ensure effectiveness. Additionally, if pretreatment a urine exam shows ova, a repeat urine exam should be performed one to two months post-treatment, which leads me to those rainbows. Colored urine seems rather fanciful, even if red, especially in view of popular dolls, such as Poopsie Slime Surprise, Unicorn Rainbow, Bright Star. Something about this TWIP case and a desire for urinary equity with Technicolor feces led me to search the string Technicolor urine. Why was I surprised to find a 1974 JAMA article containing that phrase? I took a chance on rainbow urine. Well, the exact phrase wasn't found, but uroscopic rainbow was. Now digression has been carried to the level of vice, but there may be a pot of gold at the end of this uroscope. Rainbow, I mean, sorry, sorry, I'll read that again. But there may be a pot of gold at the end of this uroscopic rainbow. See a terminal curiosity and towel off vigorously, even though there is naught but anecdotal evidence to suggest that this works. Exfoliating is invigorating. Thanks for all that work you do. So, Vincent, what part of the endnotes would you like me to skip to? Just go down to a terminal curiosity and read. Terminal curiosity, a bit. sure. Okay. A terminal curiosity. TWIP 191 put me in the mind of a pretty of, the, of pretty colors and the strangeness of body fluids that are the wrong color. It harkens back to simpler times when the diagnostic apparatus was a flask and a physician and a physician's eyeball, hopefully accompanied by some experience and common sense. Meditating on urinary colors transported me back to the early 1990s when I would see the urine uh, rims in the Cook County Hospital public toilets that were often bespeckled orange by wayward urine drops from medication adherent TB patients. As hinted above, urine can take many hues from almost anywhere in the rainbow. A modern ur urine color chart is reproduced below, and it's a very colorful chart. Indeed, it is. He has some other plates showing 14th century scripts being read to a bunch of interested listeners and a chart showing flasks with various uh, samples in it colored differently, of course, to indicate various ailments associated with those colors. Uh, 14th century Euroscope Bodellian Library from the Bodellian Library. And you can uh, stop. The urine wheel you illustration is from 1506. As you can see from the above illustrations, urine was big business in the Middle Ages. The Euroscope your uroscopy jug was called a matula in Latin, chamber pot, urinal. There are many examples of the urine wheel, a primitive diagnostic aid. The example above is in the Munich Universität Bibliothek. Okay, you can stop. Hello? You can stop. <laughs> <laughs> I would be happy to stop now. Yeah, he has a lot more information on colors of urine, does, which is great. He so does, he does. I recommend that people read it. Uh, God, Daniel, you're next. Certainly. James writes, writing from La Jolla, California, where the sea breeze is blowing a gentle 50F, 10C. Back in Denver, it's snowing. Those poor people. My guess with red urine in Africa is schistosoma hematobium, common in Lake Malawi. In the pathology review course, they gave us the mnemonic that schistosoma egg looks a bit like a urinary bladder in shape associated with the bladder cancer worldwide. I remember an Amazon fish <laughs> that's reported to cause hematuria, uh, Candera catfish that supposedly swims up the urethra and lodges there with its spines. Makes a great legend. Probably not true, but still causes a reflex crossing of the legs. There are other causes of hematuria, of course. Lots of bacteria, a few fungi, drugs, etc. But this is TWIP, James M. Small. Well, we have a lot more. When is our uh, guest coming on, Daniel? Do you know? So he's going to come on at 630. And what I'm going to do is I will shoot him a text and he will jump on. So I have about, what, 18, 20 minutes to uh, yeah. power through. All right. Let's try and summarize, okay? Good okay. idea. 
Chad writes, uh, schist urinary schistosomiasis, Lake Malawi, um, Prazi Quantil. My apologies if this guest is out there. I was trying to investigate using my <laughs> wife's textbooks. Usually I play her the podcast and she just gives me the answer. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> okay. Dixon, can you summarize Andrew? Yeah, sure. Andrew writes, Keora from Pangorora. We've had a lot of emails from Andrew in the past, and we're glad to get another one. You list the weather. It's up and down, of course, and that's typical for New Zealand no matter what. He still laments not having won a book. Well, who knows? Maybe today's your lucky day, Andrew. And then he guesses, of course, correctly, that it's just a soma hematobium in Lake Malawi. And he gives all of the uh, common features that we've already reviewed in other emails. And then he says there is a possible way that the infection could have occurred quickly, and that is to do with a report in the IFL science of the parasites, presumably gravid, crawling up the urethra in a British tourist Think about it. This is a, no, I don't, okay, so I skipped through that one. And he, by the way, he says, uh, see you later. <laughs> and nice to hear from you, Andrew. So I was uh, on a, I was on a live stream and I, and Andrew was there because he said, Kia Ora from Pangaro. And I said, is that you from TWIP? He said, yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. cool. Daniel. That's funny. Uh, Alan writes esteemed TWIP, TWIPsters and uh, Aloha from Kona, Hawaii. Um, and also we are seeing here a water contact disease, schistosomiasis or bilharzia. Um, a little bit about uh, studies out of Cameroon. Um, and I will, I will call it there. So that's from University of the Nations from Kona, Hawaii. It's interesting that he says in Cameroon, only the wealthier boys would show up with hematuria because the poor ones had to work. They couldn't swim. It's interesting. interesting. Isn't that interesting. interesting? I like that. I like when there's that social aspect. Uh, Elise writes, dear Twip Trifecta, Elise, uh, writing from Lower Manhattan in the snowstorm, teenager with red urine, uh, schistosoma hematobia, praziquantal. Uh, given that one family member was infected, but the whole family had been swimming, what happened to the rest? It's a good question. Uh, pr vigorous toweling off, how to prevent future infections. Did the family continue swimming? As always, many, many, many thanks for everything you do. Dixon. Uh, Anthony writes, I can read the whole email because it's very close, very sh short. It, it appears someone did not take the doctor's advice for vigorously drying off after having fun in Lake Malawi. Final diagnosis, just a soma species. Anthony, self-taught biochemistry nerd and pharmacy tech hopeful. Daniel. Uh, Sean writes, gentlemen, loved Dixon's story and the devil's really in the details. Size matters. That was about the uh, worm in the eye. Um, and let's see what his guess is. I love Africa and the zebras that come with it. Lake Malawi is well known for schistosomiasis. All right. I'm just reading his email. It's cute. Uh, Caton writes, greetings from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, fellow tippers. Thanks us for TWIP, even though he's not a doctor. He's a country farmer. He wants to learn about parasites. Um, as I listened to Daniel, how will I figure this one out? So I did the following Google and he got urinary schistosomiasis. Touche, Daniel. Praziquantel. Thank you, Daniel, for your work with Parasites Without Borders. Uh, Caton is a owner of a grass-fed beef company. I'm getting yeah. hungry. Sounds good. <laughs> Dixon. Yeah. Rebecca writes, and she uh, she says, dear TWIP professors, and she's uh, a member of the Parasitology Club at the University of uh, Central Lancaster uh, in uh, Northwest England. And it's cloudy, of course, and she and the group guests, just to some hematobium, which is uh, their answer. Uh, we're not saying that's correct, mind you. Um, and it gives the proper medication, and except in this case, it's three times a day. And uh, other family members were also swimming, but they did not become infected. And she tends to say why, uh, not necessarily the right answer. But nonetheless, glad to hear from you and uh, keep up the good work. Josie, dear triple trouble twippers, um, after two not too terrible, but still two wrong answers. I like this one. And she goes with Schistosomes, M Lake Malawi, and Prazi Quanto. And then we get a little bit of a discussion about uh, Egyptian men, um, Egyptian women. 
Um, and let's see. Incidentally, the episodes on schistosomes have also revealed something that I had always wondered why I only developed red spots during my second year of Girl Scouts camp. So I think there she's making a reference to avian schistosomes um, and the allergic reaction to um, repeat exposures. Uh, Josie's in library hell. Josie won the book last time. All right. Melissa writes... Just the Soma Hematobium from a windy Toronto. That's it for that one. Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren writes, uh, hello, Twip. She's a, uh, let's see. Yep. Yeah, she guessed the same thing. Uh, hematuria, just a Soma. Uh, Trematode, just a Soma. And doesn't seem to mention a species here. I'm reading down, trying to find it. Uh, doesn't commit to the species, but she still says schistosoma. Has the life cycle correct? Um, okay, then. That she apologizes to Vincent for anthropomorphizing. Well, you know, <laughs> she just can't seem to help herself, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Owen, I got a short one here. Daniel is going easy on us this month. Hematuria after swimming in Lake Malawi makes me think of urinary schistosomiasis most likely due to schistosoma hematobium. All right, the last one's from Erica. You guys seem to be getting quite popular, so I'll keep this short. Schistosomiasis. Prazi Quantil. Um, but she doesn't give the species, right, Dixon? Right, Vincent. And she also hedges on the drug because oxy oxamniquin is a different drug than Prazi Quantil. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, you want to give away a book, or you want to call in your guest, Dixon? What do you What do you think it is? I don't know. I was stumped on this one. I <laughs> I had to read the emails in order to get a hint. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Of course, no. It was pretty obvious what it was, and um, too bad for the kid. But uh, I guess he got better right away. And uh, good question about the rest of the family. Maybe they were a lower. An infection that he was, they spent less time in the water. Maybe they had light infections or not infections at all. But but I'm, I'm pretty clear that it's just a soma hematobium. What about you, Vincent? You want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I took the easy way, you know, because if you go to the Carter page, you see little kids there with vials of their urine that's red. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. All right. Yeah, I actually, um, yeah, I have to say, um, hopefully, yeah, people, I'm glad people got this right. Um, I, I said I was going to share my experience when I was uh, there in Malawi. We, of course, decided we were going to go to Lake Malawi. You know, it's hot, right? So I'm um, explaining to my family, listen, we're going to Lake Malawi. You can't swim in the water because <laughs> of the parasites. And then we get there and it's just so darn hot. So we all went swimming in Lake Malawi. But we're there, you know, and I'm, of course, thinking about the parasites. But I noticed there's a lifeguard. And I go over to the lifeguard and I ask him, I say, so can you swim? I'm trying to figure out why there's a lifeguard. He's no, no. I was like, well, what, what is your job then? He said, well, <laughs> if I yell really loudly, it means one of the crocodiles is getting too close. <laughs> and you can run out of the water. Great. So apparently the real fear was the crocodiles. Uh, but no, when my, um, when my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, their three boys uh, came back from Malawi, um, they were really presented with two options. One is to do uh, blood testing, everyone in the family, because they'd been going to like Malawi, like so many other expats, um, or you could just go ahead and just treat with Praziquantel once and then do another treatment, we'll say two to four weeks later. Um, because, you know, you're going there and even though other people might not have hematuria, um, it's just so endemic, you're swimming in the water. Um, mm. So you can either check serology. Um, but yeah, no, when I got out, I vigorously toweled off. I don't know if that works, <laughs> but that was my that was my approach. All right, while <laughs> we guys were chatting, I uh, ran the random number generator. Our winner is Andrew, our high school teacher. Nice! From North Carolina. So Andrew, send me your uh, address, twip at microbe.tv, and we'll send a book down. Oh, you can give it, to your, that you is terrific. give it to your library. Well, okay then. Um, my pick this week is a, a, a man that I knew very well as while I was a graduate student at Notre Dame. Uh, he was a, a rising star in the field of medical entomology. His name was George B. Craig. And in fact, one of the authors on our book, um, Robert Guads, got his PhD with him. Um, George Craig was 
a very unusual man uh, in many ways. Uh, and he had huge uh, intellectual interests in genetics, in um, ecology, in virology, in fact, Vincent, because a lot of the mosquitoes that he was studying, particularly uh, Aedes albopictus and, and lots of other Aedes species, which he learned how to clone in the laboratory and study their genetics for, um, he became famous and he was a National Academy of Science member. He was also a member of the Cosmos Club and he loved fishing. So we used to go up to the Northern uh, Peninsula of Michigan at the Notre Dame Biological Station and fish, as well as, uh, you know, discuss science and have a good time. And um, a remarkable man in every way and devoted to his science, so devoted that uh, he actually passed away at a medical entomology meeting. Not that the meeting killed him. It is the fact that he was he was a young man. He was only 65 years old when he died. Wow. He died of a heart attack. He, he was a college wrestler. And as a result, he said he used to wrestle in three different weight classes. He could change his weight remarkably fast. And he, he became really well known for that. And unfortunately, when he got to be an adult, he was unable to change his weight. It just kept getting heavier and heavier. And uh, unfortunately, he ended up as a uh, as a very obese individual and uh, regretted it, but didn't know what to do about it. And eventually it took his life. Wow. But uh, he was he trained numerous graduate students. He's a world famous um, name in medical entomology still today and uh, was basically the same category as uh, Theodosius Dobshansky was to establishing the fruit fly as a genetic organism. George B. Craig established Aedes aegypti as a genetic organism. And um, he was a truly interesting man and a wonderful uh, gentleman. And I, with, with a, 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 I can't tell you how enthusiastic he was when we went to basketball games. He was embarrassingly enthusiastic. His voice could be heard above everybody else. They knew who it was. They appreciated it. And he was, he was their biggest fan. And so nice. um, I loved him dearly. And, um, and everybody misses his presence because he was such a, a driving force in, in, in lots of other things besides just science. Wonderful. Thank you, right. Dixon. So it looks like we have a fourth, uh, a fourth fox there. Uh, indeed. <laughs> then, do you want to? No name in the hole. We though. will, we will join you in. We'll loop you in. Oh, sure. there's hey. the name. Hey everyone, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Auden. Happy Hello, to be on Auden. the show. Oh, it's a how pleasure do you to have you. How do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Lear, like Lear Jet. Lear, so, uh, they're, they're Daniel, nice. are you buddies? Is that how this came about? I, I like to feel we're uh, we're colleagues, a, a fellow. I guess you're more early career than I am in your infectious disease pursuits. Uh, but a really interesting case that we were talking about that um, we were hoping would be shared with our listeners. Um, and I was hoping we won't talk, we won't tell too much about who you are today. Okay. Um, but my thought is when we bring you back to do the unveil, <laughs> then we'll give a little bit more of the background. Who Who is this exciting mystery individual with such a great case? Sure, happy to oblige. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. So, yeah, so uh, we have a case here of a older gentleman uh, who presented to our hospital with chills, muscle aches, headaches, and a worsening uh, shortness of breath. And notably had had several family members who he lived with who had also had similar symptoms. Um, he did have a history of hypertension and diabetes and uh, was pretty, un, uh, pretty poorly controlled with that. Um, but I think an important part of his history is that he was actually from and had emigrated from rural part of Ecuador where he had previously worked in the timber industry. And he had spent some time on, on the farm as well, sodding the soil. Um, the family in Snoke did not have any pets, no dogs, no cats, no um, reptiles or other animals of any sort. And he lived in and around the hospital area and kind of this urban area. Um, so he came to the hospital. He was ultimately found to be positive for COVID and was put it into one of our COVID isolation units and was treated and received a cocktail of intravenous steroids and antibiotics and uh, ultimately ended up doing getting worse uh, over the course of the next two weeks. He got some more courses of IV steroids and antibiotics and mm -hmm. developed a bloodstream infection and, and a pneumonia. And then about three weeks in, 
the infectious disease service was ultimately involved because one of our technicians, the Tansy had actually noted that on the agar plate, he'd seen this very interesting, creepy, crawly, serpiginous kind of trail and had alerted us to uh, what was going on. And we actually had daily microbiology labs. So he had called us in and, and this was during COVID time. So we couldn't come in person, but we joined in via Zoom. And so he was able to show us that uh, via video. And then we'd asked one of our uh, resident colleagues to, who was working in the microbiology lab to uh, take a look under the microscope. And so he had taken a look and sent us some photos and they were very, very interesting. And <laughs> we had a, a strong suspicion at that time what it was, uh, but we're ultimately blown away. And uh, we were able to start this gentleman on uh, a course of appropriate treatment. And he did ultimately have a little bit of a rocky course shortly thereafter, but he did recover. And then I'm very happy to say that he made a full recovery and was ultimately discharged from the hospital. So this, this, and this plate, this yeah. sample, it was a, it was a blood sample. It was a sputum sample. Yeah, exactly. I want to know that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was, it was a sputum sample. Aha. And this gentleman um, is HIV negative, right? <laughs> he was HIV negative. Yes. And Vincent he, likes to ask that. That's his. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, and he's living with his family here in the U.S., correct? Yes, that is correct, to the best of my knowledge. And you say, did his family have COVID also, or they had some uh, something else that you didn't diagnose? Yeah, I bet they did. Yeah, the, yeah, the, full, the family was ultimately also uh, several members, including the wife and two daughters, were ultimately diagnosed with COVID as well. But nobody was oh. ill enough uh, to go to the hospital aside from him. Hmm. Can you talk about the blood work at all, or should we guess at that later? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can talk a little bit about the blood work. So he did not ultimately have this organism in the blood, uh, but had uh, a couple of different bacterial uh, species that were associated with what we thought was uh, a pneumonia, and also potentially from elsewhere as well in the, perhaps the GI tract. And I was referring to the differential, actually. Ah, okay. <laughs> Any unusual features about the differential blood work? Like neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, things yeah, like that. Yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> so interestingly, when he came in, he had no eosinophils, and about three weeks later had then developed a florid eosinophilia. Uh, he had a little bit of a low lymphocyte count, which was kind of common with COVID when he initially came in. Um, mm. But otherwise, that was kind of one distinguishing feature. And I understand stool was sent as well, and that was completely negative. Stool was sent off. It was completely negative. Serology was sent off for various right, organisms that came back negative. Right. Uh, let, let me already just, told uh, us too much. Let me, let me just... <laughs> I just want to verify that you do not work for the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> this, my this, was a, this was a human being. <laughs> this is a, an Andean condor. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yeah, you, you, may, you may not get the joke there. We we had a case where it was actually a, uh, it was a penguin at the Bronx Zoo with malaria. Exactly. It had malaria, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no kidding. No yeah. kidding. No, it was, it was yeah, fascinating. Yeah, the, the, the fellow who presented it was uh was director of the zoo and he came out we didn't say we didn't tell anyone who he was <laughs> right <laughs> wow it was that fun was marvelous. and then we marvelous. went to the zoo uh, a few weeks later and recorded there for the reveal and he was right in the middle of the penguins when he revealed that it was great that was a great episode yeah that right. was a lot of fun it was fantastic it was fantastic. on site too it was like it was great to just visit there was an yeah, avian. We should, have, uh, we should have gone when the cats all were getting COVID, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yes, that's right. So, what was, what, you was like, the, uh, uh, what was the exposure for the penguin? Was a penguin doing some traveling? Yeah, <laughs> it's actually it's interesting, and it is a little bit of an aside. But um, you know, most of the birds that you see, eighty percent of the birds that you see flying around, actually have different species of. Um, of plasmodium, the avian exactly. species. And so you bring these um, these birds either from remote islands or from Arctic areas where there are no mosquitoes, and they actually are susceptible to different um, forms of malaria. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, yeah. I 
published a paper about a year ago, oddly enough, on um, <laughs> you know which subspecies of avian malaria can actually cause the penguins and the Arctic, you know, the different birds um, to actually get sick and get ill. And you actually have to you take the frozen herring and you put medicine in there and feed um, the birds to get them well again. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how many herrings per kilo? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually primaquin. Interesting is how you treat the uh, the birds, but oh wow, yeah, I was going to ask if there was artemisinin or or malarone or whichever, but interesting. Yeah. And the penguin oh, recovered right, so fully. I think that's probably enough, right, for people to uh, yeah, that's to good. Tongue. Figure this out. Should we, you want to wrap yeah, up this episode? Good. Is uh, should we close it right here, guys? Is That'd that be good? good. Yeah, I think. All right. And then in a month, we're going to come back with the exciting unveil. We will. All right. That's uh, TWIP number 192. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP if you like what we do. Well, first, if you want to make a guess on the case or send us an email, TWIP at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, and and I Dr. Lear is from a mystery institution of right. which we will learn more. Yeah, about. I'd like to actually pursue that a little further. <laughs> next time. <here. laughs> thank you, Dr. Lear. We'll see you next time. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. parasitic.